The Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, fought during 25 the 27th of October 1942, sometimes referred to as the Battle of Santa Cruz or Third Battle of Solomon Sea, in Japan as the Battle of the South Pacific, was the fourth aircraft carrier battle of the Pacific campaign of World War II. It was also the fourth major naval engagement fought between the United States Navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy during the lengthy and strategically important Guadalcanal campaign. As in the battles of the Coral Sea, Midway, and the Eastern Solomons, the ships of the two adversaries were rarely in sight or gun range of each other. Instead, almost all attacks by both sides were mounted by carrier or land-based aircraft. In an attempt to drive allied forces from Guadalcanal and nearby islands and end the stalemate that had existed since September 1942, the Imperial Japanese Army planned a major ground offensive on Guadalcanal for 20 the 25th of October 1942. In support of this offensive, and with the hope of engaging allied naval forces, Japanese carriers and other large warships moved into a position near the southern Solomon Islands. From this location, the Japanese naval forces hoped to engage and decisively defeat any allied naval forces, especially carrier forces, that responded to the ground offensive. Allied naval forces also hoped to meet the Japanese naval forces in battle, with the same objectives of breaking the stalemate, and decisively defeating their adversary. The Japanese ground offensive on Guadalcanal was underway with the battle for Henderson Field while the naval warships and aircraft from the two adversaries confronted each other on the morning of 26 October 1942, just north of the Santa Cruz Islands. After an exchange of carrier air attacks, Allied surface ships retreated from the battle area with the fleet carrier Hornet sunk, and another fleet carrier, Enterprise, heavily damaged. The participating Japanese carrier forces also retired because of high aircraft and aircrew losses, plus significant damage to the fleet carrier Shokoku and the light carrier Zuiho. Santa Cruz was a tactical victory and a short-term strategic victory for the Japanese in terms of ships sunk and damaged, and control of the seas around Guadalcanal. However, Japan's loss of many irreplaceable veteran aircrews proved to be a long-term strategic advantage for the Allies, whose aircrew losses in the battle were relatively low and quickly replaced. Chapter 1 – Background On 7 August 1942, Allied forces, predominantly from the U.S., landed on Japanese-occupied Guadalcanal, Tulagi, and the Florida Islands in the Solomon Islands. The landings on the islands were meant to deny their use by the Japanese as bases for threatening the supply routes between the U.S. and Australia, and to secure the islands as starting points for a campaign with the eventual goal of neutralizing the major Japanese base at Rabaul while also supporting the Allied New Guinea campaign. The landings initiated the six-month-long Guadalcanal campaign. After the Battle of the Eastern Solomons on 24-25 August, in which the fleet carrier USS Enterprise was heavily damaged and forced to sail to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, for a month of major repairs, three U.S. carrier task forces remained in the South Pacific area. The task forces were based around the fleet carriers USS Wasp, Saratoga, and Hornet plus their respective air groups and supporting surface warships, including battleships, cruisers, and destroyers, and were primarily stationed between the Solomons and New Hebrides Islands. In this area of operations, the carriers were charged with guarding the line of communication between the major Allied bases at New Caledonia and Espiritu Santo, supporting the Allied ground forces at Guadalcanal and Tulagi against any Japanese counteroffensives, covering the movement of supply ships to Guadalcanal, and engaging and destroying any Japanese warships, especially carriers, that came within range. The area of ocean in which the U.S. carrier task forces operated was known as Torpedo Junction by U.S. forces because of the high concentration of Japanese submarines in the area. On 31 August, Saratoga was torpedoed by Japanese submarine I-26 and was out of action for three months for repairs. On 15 September, WASP was hit by three torpedoes fired by Japanese submarine I-19 while supporting a major reinforcement and resupply convoy to Guadalcanal and almost engaging the Japanese carriers Shokoku and Zuikoku, 
which withdrew just before the two adversaries came into range of each other's aircraft. With power knocked out from torpedo damage, WASP's damage control teams were unable to contain the ensuing large fires, and she was abandoned and scuttled. Although the US now had only one operational carrier, Hornet, in the South Pacific, the Allies still maintained air superiority over the southern Solomon Islands because of their aircraft based at Henderson Field on Guadalcanal. However, at night, when aircraft were not able to operate effectively, the Japanese were able to operate their ships around Guadalcanal almost at will. Thus, a stalemate in the battle for Guadalcanal developed, the Allies delivered supplies and reinforcements to Guadalcanal during the day, and the Japanese did the same by warship, referred to as the Tokyo Express by the Allies, at night, with neither side able to deliver enough troops to the island to secure a decisive advantage. By mid-October, both sides had roughly an equal number of troops on the island. The stalemate was briefly interrupted by two large, ship naval actions. On the night of 11-12 October, a U.S. naval force intercepted and defeated a Japanese naval force en route to bombard Henderson Field in the Battle of Cape Esperance. But just two nights later, a Japanese force that included the battleships Haruna and Congo successfully bombarded Henderson Field, destroying most of the U.S. aircraft there and inflicting severe damage on the field's facilities. The U.S. made two moves to try to break the stalemate in the battle for Guadalcanal. First, repairs to Enterprise were expedited so that she could return to the South Pacific as soon as possible. On 10 October, Enterprise received her new air group, and on 16 October, she left Pearl Harbor, and on 23 October, she arrived back in the South Pacific and rendezvoused with Hornet and the rest of the Allied South Pacific Naval Forces on 24 October, 273 nautical miles northeast of Espiritu Santo. Second, on 18 October, Admiral Chester Nimitz, Allied Commander in Chief of Pacific Forces, replaced Vice Admiral Robert L. Gormley with Vice Admiral William Halsey Jr. as Commander, South Pacific Area. This position commanded Allied forces involved in the Solomon Islands campaign. Nimitz felt that Gormley had become too myopic and pessimistic to lead Allied forces effectively in the struggle for Guadalcanal. Halsey was reportedly respected throughout the U.S. naval fleet as a fighter. Upon assuming command, Halsey immediately began making plans to draw the Japanese naval forces into a battle, writing to Nimitz, I had to begin throwing punches almost immediately. The Japanese combined fleet was also seeking to draw Allied naval forces into what was hoped to be a decisive battle. Two fleet carriers, Hayo and Junio, as well as the light carrier Zuiho, arrived at the main Japanese naval base at Truk Atoll from Japan in early October and joined Shokoku and Zuikoku. With five carriers fully equipped with air groups, plus their numerous battleships, cruisers and destroyers, the Japanese combined fleet, directed by Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, was confident that it could make up for the defeat at the Battle of Midway. Apart from a couple of air raids on Henderson Field in October, the Japanese carriers and their supporting warships stayed in the northwestern area of the Solomon Islands, out of the battle for Guadalcanal and waiting for a chance to approach and engage the U.S. carriers. With the Japanese Army's next planned major ground attack on Allied forces on Guadalcanal set for 20 October, Yamamoto's warships began to move towards the southern Solomons to support the offensive and to be ready to engage any enemy ships, especially carriers, that approached to support the Allied defenses on Guadalcanal. Chapter 2 – Prelude From 20-25 to 25 October, Japanese land forces on Guadalcanal attempted to capture Henderson Field with a large-scale attack against the U.S. defenders. The attack was decisively defeated with heavy casualties for the Japanese. Incorrectly believing that the Japanese army troops had succeeded in capturing Henderson Field, the Japanese sent warships toward Guadalcanal on the morning of 25 October to support their ground forces on the island. Aircraft from Henderson Field attacked the convoy throughout the day, sinking the light cruiser Yura, and damaging the destroyer Akizuki. 
Despite the failure of the Japanese ground offensive and the loss of Eura, the rest of the combined fleet continued to maneuver near the southern Solomon Islands on 25 October in the hope of engaging Allied naval forces in a battle. The Japanese naval forces now comprised four carriers, because Hayo had suffered a serious accidental fire in her engine room on the 22nd of October that forced her to return to truck for repairs. The Japanese naval forces were divided into three groups, the advanced force of Junio, two battleships, four heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, and ten destroyers commanded by Vice Admiral Nobutak Kondo in heavy cruiser Atago, the main body of Shokoku, Zuikoku, and Zuiho plus one heavy cruiser and eight destroyers. Commanded by Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo aboard Shokoku, and the vanguard force of two battleships, three heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, and seven destroyers, commanded by Rear Admiral Hiroaki Abe in the battleship Hiei. In addition to commanding the advanced force, Kondo acted as the overall commander of the three forces. On the U.S. side, the Hornet and Enterprise task groups, under the overall command of Rear Admiral Thomas Kincaid, swept around to the north of the Santa Cruz Islands on 25 October, searching for the Japanese naval forces. The U.S. warships were deployed as two separate carrier groups, separated from each other by about 10 nautical miles. A U.S. PBY Catalina reconnaissance seaplane based in the Santa Cruz Islands located the Japanese main body carriers at 11.03. However, the Japanese carriers were about 355 nautical miles from the U.S. force, just beyond carrier aircraft range. Kincaid, hoping to close the range to be able to execute an attack that day, steamed towards the Japanese carriers at top speed and, at 14.25, launched a strike force of 23 aircraft. But the Japanese, knowing that they had been spotted by U.S. aircraft and not knowing where the U.S. carriers were, turned to the north to stay out of range of the U.S. carrier's aircraft. Thus, the U.S. strike force returned to its carriers without finding or attacking the Japanese warships. Chapter 3, Lattle Chapter 3 Section 1 Carrier action on the 26th of October, first strikes. At 2.50 on the 26th of October, the Japanese naval forces reversed direction and the naval forces of the two adversaries closed the distance until they were only 200 nautical miles away from each other by 5 o'clock. Both sides launched search aircraft and prepared their remaining aircraft to attack as soon as the other side's ships were located. Although a radar-equipped Catalina sighted the Japanese carriers at 3.10, the report did not reach Kincaid until 5.12. Therefore, believing that the Japanese ships had probably changed position during the intervening two hours, he decided to withhold launching a strike force until he received more current information on the location of the Japanese ships. At 6.45, a U.S. scout aircraft sighted the carriers of Nagumo's main body. At 6.58, a Japanese scout aircraft reported the location of Hornet's task force. Both sides raced to be the first to attack the other. The Japanese were first to get their strike force launched, with 64 aircraft, including 21 Aichi D-3A2 dive bombers, 20 Nakajima B-5N2 torpedo bombers, 21 A6M30 fighters, and two Nakajima B5N2 contact aircraft on the way towards Hornet by 7.40. This first strike was commanded by Lieutenant Commander Shigeharu Murata, while the fighter cover was led by Lieutenant Sayoshi Rene and Sanyasu Hideka. Also at 7.40, two U.S. minus three Solomon Islands dollars dauntless scout aircraft, responding to the earlier sighting of the Japanese carriers, arrived and dove on Zuiho. With the Japanese combat air patrol busy chasing other U.S. scout aircraft away, the two U.S. aircraft were able to hit Zuiho with both their 500-pound bombs, causing heavy damage and preventing the carrier's flight deck from being able to land aircraft. Meanwhile, Kondo ordered Abe's vanguard force to race ahead to try to intercept and engage the U.S. warships. Kondo also brought his own advanced force forward at flank speed so that Junio's aircraft could join in the attacks on the U.S. ships. At 8.10, Shokoku launched a second wave of strike aircraft, consisting of 19 dive bombers and five zeros, 
and Zuikoku launched 16 torpedo bombers and four zeros at 8.40. The second strike leader was Lieutenant Commander Mamoru Seki, while the fighter cover was led by Lieutenant Hideki Shingo. Thus, by 9.10 the Japanese had 110 aircraft on the way to attack the U.S. carriers. The U.S. strike aircraft were running about 20 minutes behind the Japanese. Believing that a speedy attack was more important than a massed attack, and because they lacked fuel to spend time assembling prior to the strike, the U.S. aircraft proceeded in small groups towards the Japanese ships, rather than forming into a single large strike force. The first group, consisting of 15 Douglas SBD Dauntless dive bombers, 6 Grumman TBF-1 Avenger torpedo bombers, and 8 Grumman F-4F Wildcat fighters, led by Lieutenant Commander William J. Gus Wilhelm from Hornet, was on its way by about 8 o'clock. A second group, consisting of three SBDs, nine TBFs, and eight Wildcats from Enterprise, was off by 8.10. A third group, consisting of nine SBDs, ten TBFs, and seven F4Fs from Hornet, was on its way by 08 colon 20. At 8.40, the opposing aircraft strike formations passed within sight of each other. Lieutenant Hideka's 9 Zuiho Zeros surprised and attacked the Enterprise group, attacking the climbing aircraft from out of the sun. In the resulting engagement, four Zeros, three Wildcats, and two TBFs were shot down, with another two TBFs and a Wildcat forced to return to Enterprise with heavy damage. The remaining Zuiho Zeros, having exhausted their ammunition, withdrew from the action. At 8.50, the lead U.S. attack formation from Hornet spotted four ships from Abe's vanguard force. Pressing on, the U.S. aircraft sighted the Japanese carriers and prepared to attack. Three Zeros from Zuiho attacked the formation's Wildcats, drawing them away from the bombers they were assigned to protect. Thus, the dive bombers in the first group initiated their attacks without fighter escort. Twelve Zeros from the Japanese carrier cap attacked the SBD formation, shot down two, and forced two more to abort. The remaining eleven SBDs commenced their attack dives on Shokoku at 9.27, hitting her with three to six bombs, wrecking her flight deck, and causing serious damage to the interior of the ship. The final SBD of the eleven lost track of Shokoku and instead, dropped its bomb near the Japanese destroyer Terazuki, causing minor damage. The six TBFs in the first strike force, having become separated from their strike group, did not find the Japanese carriers and eventually turned back towards Hornet. On the way back, they attacked the Japanese heavy cruiser tone, missing with all their torpedoes. The TBFs of the second U.S. attack formation from Enterprise were unable to locate the Japanese carriers and instead attacked the Japanese heavy cruiser Suzuya from Abe's vanguard force but caused no damage. At about the same time, nine SBDs from the third U.S. attack formation, from Hornet, found Abe's ships and attacked the Japanese heavy cruiser Chikuma, hitting her with two 1,000 pounds bombs and causing heavy damage. The three Enterprise SBDs then arrived and also attacked Chikuma, causing more damage with one bomb hit and two near misses. Finally, the nine TBFs from the third strike group arrived and attacked the smoking Chikuma, scoring one more hit. Chikuma, escorted by two destroyers, withdrew from the battle and headed towards truck for repairs. The U.S. carrier forces received word from their outbound strike aircraft at 8.30 that Japanese attack aircraft were headed their way. At 8.52, the Japanese strike force commander sighted the Hornet task force, the Enterprise task force was hidden by a rain squall, and deployed his aircraft for attack. At 8.55, the U.S. carriers detected the approaching Japanese aircraft on radar, about 35 nautical miles away, and began to vector the 37 wildcats of their cap to engage the incoming Japanese aircraft. However, communication problems, mistakes by the U.S. fighter control directors, and primitive control procedures prevented all but a few of the wildcats from engaging the Japanese aircraft before they began their attacks on Hornet. Although the U.S. cap was able to shoot down or damage several dive bombers, most of the Japanese aircraft commenced their attacks relatively unmolested by U.S. fighters. 
At 9.09, the anti-aircraft guns of Hornet and her escorting warships opened fire as the 20 untouched, Japanese torpedo planes and remaining 16 dive bombers commenced their attacks on the carrier. At 9.12, a dive bomber placed its 250 kg semi-armor-piercing ordinary bomb dead center on Hornet's flight deck, across from the island, which penetrated three decks before exploding, killing 60 men. Moments later, a 242 kg high-explosive land bomb struck the flight deck, detonating on impact to create an 11-feet hole and kill 30 men. A minute or so later, a third bomb hit Hornet near where the first bomb hit, penetrating three decks before exploding, causing severe damage but no loss of life. At 9.14, a dive bomber was set on fire by Hornet's anti-aircraft guns, the pilot, Warrant Officer Shigeyuki Sato, deliberately crashed into Hornet's stack, killing seven men and spreading burning aviation fuel over the signal deck dot at the same time as the dive bombers were attacking, the 20 torpedo bombers were also approaching Hornet from two different directions. Despite suffering heavy losses from anti-aircraft fire, including Murata, the torpedo planes planted two torpedoes in Hornet's side between 9.13 and 9.17, knocking out her engines. As Hornet came to a stop, a damaged, Japanese dive bomber approached and purposely crashed into the carrier's side, starting a fire near the ship's main supply of aviation fuel. At 9.20, the surviving Japanese aircraft departed, leaving Hornet dead in the water and burning. Twenty-five Japanese and six American aircraft were destroyed in this attack dot with the assistance of fire hoses from three escorting destroyers, the fires on Hornet were under control by 10 o'clock. Wounded personnel were evacuated from the carrier, and an attempt was made by the heavy cruiser USS Northampton under Captain Willard A. Kitts to tow Hornet away from the battle area. However, the effort to rig the tow line took some time, and more attack waves of Japanese aircraft were inbound. Chapter 3 Section 2 Carrier Action on 26 October Post First Strike Actions Starting at 9.30, Enterprise landed many of the damaged and fuel-depleted CAP fighters and returning scout aircraft from both carriers. However, with her flight deck full, and the second wave of incoming Japanese aircraft detected on radar at 9.30, Enterprise ceased landing operations at 10 o'clock. Fuel-depleted aircraft then began ditching in the ocean, and the carrier's escorting destroyers rescued the aircrews. One of the ditching aircraft, a damaged TBF from Enterprise's strike force that had been attacked earlier by Zeros from Zuiho, crashed into the water near the destroyer USS Porter. As Porter rescued the TBF's aircrew, she was struck by a torpedo, possibly from the ditched aircraft, causing heavy damage and killing 15 crewmen. After the task force commander ordered the destroyer scuttled, the crew was rescued by the destroyer USS Shaw which then sank Porter with gunfire. As the first wave of Japanese strike aircraft began returning to their carriers from their attack on Hornet, one of them spotted the Enterprise task force, which had now emerged from the rain squall, and reported the carrier's position. The second Japanese aircraft strike wave, believing Hornet to be sinking, directed their attacks on the Enterprise Task Force, beginning at 10.08. Again, the US CAP had trouble intercepting the Japanese aircraft before they attacked Enterprise, shooting down only two of the 19 dive bombers as they began their dives on the carrier. Attacking through the intense anti-aircraft fire put up by Enterprise and her escorting warships, Seki's division attacked first and scored no hits. Next attacked the division led by Lieutenant Kichi Arima that scored hits on the carrier with two 250 kg semi-AP ordinary bombs, where the first one was released by Arima's pilot, Petty Officer Kyoto Furuta. The two bombs killed 44 men and wounded 75, and caused heavy damage to the carrier, including jamming her forward elevator in the up position. In addition, Arima's division also achieved a near miss with another bomb. However, 10 of the 19 Japanese bombers were lost in this attack, including Sekis, with two more ditching on their return. 20 minutes later, the 16 Zuikoku torpedo planes arrived and split up to attack Enterprise. 
one group of torpedo bombers was attacked by two Cap Wildcats which shot down three of them and damaged a fourth. On fire, the fourth damaged aircraft purposely crashed into the destroyer Smith, setting the ship on fire and killing 57 of her crew. The torpedo carried by this aircraft detonated shortly after impact, causing more damage. The fires initially seemed out of control until Smith's commanding officer ordered the destroyer to steer into the large spraying wake of the battleship USS South Dakota, which helped put out the fires. Smith then resumed her station, firing her remaining anti-aircraft guns at the torpedo planes. The remaining torpedo planes attacked Enterprise South Dakota, and the cruiser Portland, but all of their torpedoes missed or failed, causing no damage. The engagement was over at 10.53, nine of the 16 torpedo aircraft were lost in this attack. After suppressing most of the onboard fires, at 11.15 Enterprise reopened her flight deck to begin landing returning aircraft from the morning US strikes on the Japanese warship forces. However, only a few aircraft landed before the next wave of Japanese strike aircraft arrived and began their attacks on Enterprise, forcing a suspension of landing operations. Between 9.05 and 9.14, Junio had arrived within 280 nautical miles of the U.S. carriers and launched a strike of 17 dive bombers and 12 zeros, under the command of Lieutenant Yoshio Shiga. As the Japanese main body and advanced force maneuvered to try to join formations, Junio readied follow-up strikes. At 11.21, the Junio aircraft arrived and dove on the Enterprise task force. The dive bombers scored one near miss on Enterprise, causing more damage, and one hit each on South Dakota and light cruiser San Juan, causing moderate damage to both ships. Eight of the 17 Japanese dive bombers were destroyed in this attack, with three more ditching on their return. At 11.35, with Hornet out of action, Enterprise heavily damaged, and the Japanese assumed to have one or two undamaged carriers in the area, Kincaid decided to withdraw Enterprise and her screening ships from the battle. Leaving Hornet behind, Kincaid directed the carrier and her task force to retreat as soon as they were able. Between 11.39 and 13.22, Enterprise recovered 57 of the 73 airborne U.S. aircraft as she retreated. The remaining U.S. aircraft ditched in the ocean, and their aircrews were rescued by escorting warships. Dot between 1140 and 1400 hours, the two undamaged Japanese carriers, Zuikoku and Junio, recovered the few aircraft that returned from the morning strikes on Hornet and Enterprise and prepared follow up strikes. It was now that the devastating losses sustained during these attacks became apparent. Lieutenant Commander Masatake Okumiya, Junio's air staff officer, described the return of the carrier's first strike groups. We searched the sky with apprehension. There were only a few planes in the air in comparison with the numbers launched several hours before. The planes lurched and staggered onto the deck, every single fighter and bomber bullet hold, as the pilots climbed wearily from their cramped cockpits, they told of unbelievable opposition, of skies choked with anti-aircraft, shell bursts and tracers. Only one of Junio's bomber leaders returned from the first strike, and upon landing he appeared so shaken that at times he could not speak coherently. At 1300 hours, Kondo's advanced force and Abe's vanguard force warships together headed directly towards the last reported position of the U.S. carrier task forces and increased speed to try to intercept them for a gun battle. The damaged carriers Zuiho and Shokoku, with Negumo still on board, retreated from the battle area, leaving Rear Admiral Kakuji Kakuta in charge of the Zuikoku and Junio aircraft forces. At 13.06, Junio launched her second strike of seven torpedo planes led by Lieutenant Yoshiaki Irikian, which were escorted by eight Zeros led by Lieutenant Shirane. At the same time, Zuikoku launched her third strike of seven torpedo planes, two dive bombers, and five zeros, under the command of Lieutenant Ichiro Tanaka. Most of the torpedo planes were armed with a 800 kg armor-piercing bomb. At 1535, Junio launched the last Japanese strike force of the day, consisting of four dive bombers and six zeros, again under the command of Lieutenant Shiga. 
After several technical problems, Northampton finally began slowly towing Hornet out of the battle area at 1445, at a speed of only 5 knots. Hornet's crew was on the verge of restoring partial power, but at 1520, Junio's second strike arrived, and the seven torpedo planes attacked the almost stationary carrier. Although six of the torpedo planes missed, at 1523, one torpedo struck Hornet amidships, which proved to be the fatal blow. The torpedo hit destroyed the repairs to the power system and caused heavy flooding and a 14-degree list. With no power to pump out the water, Hornet was given up for lost, and the crew abandoned ship. The third strike from Zuikoku attacked Hornet during this time, where B-5N level bombers hit the sinking ship with one 800 kg bomb. All of Hornet's crewmen were off by 1627. During the last Japanese attack of the day, a dive bomber from Junio's third strike dropped one more 250 kg semi-AP bomb on the sinking carrier at 17 colon 20. After being informed that Japanese forces were approaching and that further towing efforts were infeasible, Halsey ordered Hornet sunk. While the rest of the US warships retired towards the southeast to get out of range of Condos and Aid's oncoming fleet, the destroyers USS Mustin and Anderson attempted to scuttle Hornet with multiple torpedoes and over 400 shells, but she still remained afloat. With advancing Japanese naval forces only 20 minutes away, the two US destroyers abandoned Hornet's burning hulk at 2040. By 2220, the rest of Condos and Abe's warships had arrived at Hornet's location. The destroyers Meikigimo, and Akigimo then finished Hornet with 424 in torpedoes. At 1.35 on 27 October 1942, she finally sank, at approximately 08 degrees 38 s 166 degrees 43 e. Several night attacks by radar-equipped Catalinas on Junio and Terazuki, knowledge of the head start the US warships had in their retreat from the area, plus a critical fuel situation apparently caused the Japanese to reconsider further pursuit of the U.S. warships. After refueling near the northern Solomon Islands, the Japanese ships returned to their main base at Truk on 30 October. During the U.S. withdrawal from the battle area towards Espiritu Santo and New Caledonia, while taking evasive action from a Japanese submarine, South Dakota collided with the destroyer Mahan, heavily damaging Mahan. Chapter 4, Aftermath Both sides claimed victory. The Americans stated that two Shokoku-class fleet carriers had been hit with bombs and eliminated. Kincaid's summary of damage to the Japanese included hits to a battleship, three heavy cruisers, a light cruiser, and possible hits on another heavy cruiser. In reality, Shokoku, Zuiho, and Chikuma were the only ships hit during the battle, none of which sank. For their part, the Japanese asserted that they sank three American carriers, one battleship, one cruiser, one destroyer, and one unidentified large warship. Actual American losses comprised the carrier Hornet, and the destroyer Porter, and damage to Enterprise, the light cruiser San Juan, the destroyer Smith and the battleship South Dakota. The loss of Hornet was a severe blow for Allied forces in the South Pacific, leaving Enterprise as the one operational, but damaged, Allied carrier in the entire Pacific theater. As she retreated from the battle, the crew posted a sign on the flight deck, Enterprise vs. Japan. Enterprise received temporary repairs at New Caledonia and, although not fully restored, returned to the Southern Solomons area just two weeks later to support Allied forces during the naval battle of Guadalcanal. There she played an important role in what turned out to be the decisive naval engagement in the overall campaign for Guadalcanal when her aircraft sank several Japanese warships and troop transports during the naval skirmishes around Henderson Field. The lack of carriers pressed the Americans and Japanese to deploy battleships in night operations around Guadalcanal, one of only two actions in the entire Pacific War in which battleships fought each other, with South Dakota again being damaged while two Japanese battleships were lost. Although the Battle of Santa Cruz was a tactical victory for the Japanese in terms of ships sunk, it came at a high cost for their naval forces.
As Junio was the only active aircraft carrier left to challenge Enterprise or Henderson Field for the remainder of the Guadalcanal campaign. Zui Koku, despite being undamaged and having recovered the aircraft from the two damaged carriers, returned to home islands via truck for training and aircraft ferrying duties, returning to the South Pacific only in February 1943 to cover the evacuation of Japanese ground forces from Guadalcanal. Both damaged carriers were forced to return to Japan for extensive repairs and refitting. After repair, Zuiho returned to truck in late January 1943. Shokoku was under repair until March 1943 and did not return to the front until July 1943, when she was reunited with Zuikoku at truck. The most significant losses for the Japanese Navy were in aircrew. The U.S. lost 81 of the 175 aircraft that were available at the start of the battle, of these, 33 were fighters, 28 were dive bombers, and 20 were torpedo bombers. Only 26 pilots and aircrew members were lost, though. The Japanese fared much worse, especially in airmen, in addition to losing 99 aircraft of the 203 involved in the battle, they lost 148 pilots and aircrew members, including two dive bomber group leaders, three torpedo squadron leaders, and 18 other section or flight leaders. The most notable casualties were the commanders of the first two strikes, Murata and Seki. 49% of the Japanese torpedo bomber aircrews involved in the battle were killed, along with 39% of the dive bomber crews and 20% of the fighter pilots. The Japanese lost more aircrew at Santa Cruz than they had lost in each of the three previous carrier battles at Coral Sea, Midway, and Eastern Solomons. By the end of the Santa Cruz battle, at least 409 of the 765 elite Japanese carrier aviators who had participated in the attack on Pearl Harbor were dead. Having lost so many of its veteran carrier aircrew, and with no quick way to replace them, because of an institutionalized limited capacity in its naval aircrew training programs and an absence of trained reserves, the undamaged Zuikoku and Junio were also forced to return to Japan because of the scarcity of trained aircrew to man their air groups. Although the Japanese carriers returned to truck by the summer of 1943, they played no further offensive role in the Solomon Islands campaign. Admiral Nagumo was relieved of command shortly after the battle and reassigned to shore duty in Japan. He acknowledged that the victory was incomplete. His battle was a tactical win, but a shattering strategic loss for Japan, considering the great superiority of our enemy's industrial capacity, we must win every battle overwhelmingly in order to win this war. This last one, although a victory, unfortunately, was not an overwhelming victory. In retrospect, despite being a tactical victory, the battle effectively ended any hope the Japanese Navy might have had of scoring a decisive victory before the industrial might of the United States placed that goal out of reach. Historian Eric Hamill summed up the significance of the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands as, Santa Cruz was a Japanese victory. That victory cost Japan her last best hope to win the war. Military historian Dr. John Prados offers a dissenting view, asserting that this was not a Pyrrhic victory for Japan, but a strategic victory, by any reasonable measure the Battle of Santa Cruz marked a Japanese victory, and a strategic one. At its end, the Imperial Navy possessed the only operational carrier force in the Pacific. The Japanese had sunk more ships and more combat tonnage, had more aircraft remaining, and were in physical possession of the battle zone. Arguments based on aircrew losses or who owned Guadalcanal are about something else, the campaign, not the battle. In Prado's view, the real story of the aftermath is that the Imperial Navy failed to exploit their hard-won victory. Chapter 4 Section 1, World War II Carrier vs. Carrier Engagements Battle of the Coral Sea Battle of Midway Battle of the Eastern Solomons Battle of the Philippine Sea Battle off Cape Engonio